Good evening. I'm Cersei Miller, Jazz and World Music Program Coordinator at Wellesley College. On behalf of the Wellesley College Department of Music, Professor Jenny Johnson Chair, and the Wellesley College Virtual Concert Series, I am thrilled to be able to introduce Linda May Han Oh, our featured artist for this evening's Muse event. Linda May Han Oh is one of the most innovative and respected artists on the creative music scene today. A virtuoso double and electric bassist, recording artist, educator, and composer. Linda May Han Oh has just finished a guest artist residency at Wellesley College, working closely with our Blue Jazz Combos and our Blue Jazz Big Band. Over the course of the last month, Linda May Han Oh has guided our students through performing and recording some of her beautiful and challenging original compositions. We will be featuring those pieces in our spring concerts in May, so stay tuned for that. But this evening, we look forward to hearing more from Linda May Han Oh, her thoughts, insights, and her music. Linda May Han Oh will be answering some questions posed by our students and faculty, and you are all welcome to put more questions in the chat. Linda will get to as many questions as she can in the course of the evening. We ask that everyone keep your mics muted unless Linda specifically asks you a question directly. Now I will turn the evening over to Linda May Han Oh. Thank you, Cersei. Thank you so much for a great introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you all for, for being here and joining me and um, everyone here for this discussion. And uh, it's been such a pleasure the last few weeks working with such amazingly talented musicians at the school and uh, with such terrific staff who've really put in their all to make this a really rich and rewarding experience for all involved. So thank you all so much. Um, yeah, so my name is Linda Mayhan O, oh, and I'm a bass player, composer. I, um, I play in various bands in a jazz improv setting, and uh, I have five albums as a leader. I, I do many things. I, I perform on electric and acoustic bass. I write music. Um, I, um, I play on various projects. Um, and um, at the moment, I'm doing a bit of um, scoring as well. I'm starting a documentary film score in a few weeks. So um, it's quite busy. And um, I mean, I can just sort of get right into it, um, into some of the questions that the students have asked and um, also give a bit of an intro to myself for those who, who don't really know. But um, one of the questions that one of the students asked is how do you balance um, your life and career? And um, as I said, I, I keep pretty busy playing in various bands, playing with musician, musicians such as Pat Metheny, guitarist Pat Metheny, um, uh, saxophone player Joe Lovano, trumpeter Dave Douglas, uh, drummer Terry Lynn Carrington. I also teach at Berklee College of Music, um, and um, it, it's very busy. Um, I just had a almost three month year old. <laughs> um, so just juggling motherhood as well has been a huge learning curve um, in the last few months. And um, yeah, it's definitely not easy. And, and a lot of it is about time management and patience. And um, what I say to students is try and get your organizational skills together as soon as possible, you know, get your systems ready, systems of just even, you know, keeping a good calendar, an organized calendar where, you know, people ask you for gigs, you won't double book because you're organized. Um, if you're hired to play music, you know, make sure you have all those, the music in organized folders and easily accessible so that if they ask you to do a gig in three months, as well as a tour in six months, you're ready to go, you know, all those skills, um, get that together ahead of time and you will find it much easier in the long run. Um, yeah, so much a, about of the balancing act is to do with organizational skills and, you know, no one's perfect and, and you know, it, you have to sort of embrace sometimes the mess of life and um, how crazy things can get. But for me, it really helps having a solid calendar, um, sharing the calendar with my husband, who's also a musician, a freelance musician, a pianist, composer, and he also um, has started his own indie record label by Philia Records, which he's incredibly busy with, um, all the while still writing and teaching and playing music. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of just about endurance as well, time management endurance, because as a working, 
professional musician who tours, you really have to think ahead and uh, be resilient. You know, you'll have your 4.30 a.m. lobby calls. You'll have grueling travel days where there's barely a sound check and you show up to the show and they don't have the correct instrument for you or they don't even have an instrument for you. Maybe flights get cancelled and if you're the band leader, you have to reroute the whole travel plan or, you know, there's an aspect of resilience and um, problem solving that um, you have to sort of um, uh, refine as I guess as a skill you know as a, as a as a as a character trait because that's sort of essential for being a, a freelance professional musician um, yeah so so all of those things it's it's just sort of one big huge learning curve and just how to balance how to how to keep grounded having people around you friends and family who keep you down to earth and keep you grounded and give you perspective is really important for me as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I've gone through phases in my life where it's, it's all about the music and you get very obsessive about the music, but then, you know, then when family comes into play and, and everything else, you really have to step back for a minute and um, just sort of weigh up the pros and cons of certain things that you take on as well. Um, also not being afraid to say no at certain points and which is hard when you're starting out as a as a um, as a young musician because you just want to say yes to everything um, but yeah so being able to say no to certain things but it, it's crazy um, at the moment just with the little one I have um, five remote co- recordings that I have to do one of them is a full album of 14 songs so you know we've been dealing with the whole remote recording with all of the students at the moment and um, it's been a huge learning curve um, for a lot of students and um, and the more you do it the quicker you get at it but it still takes time and so we're doing that because of the pandemic um, my maternity leave is finishing finishing so I'm starting up at Berkeley again so it's all just trying to find time where you can, trying to find a quiet space when you can to do the practice, to do the recording. And sometimes the other night that that meant 1 a.m. at the other side of the house, you know. Um, so it's it's all of all a, a big balancing act. And um, yeah, it's it's just about trying to keep sane and managing everything, trying to keep as organized as possible. Yeah. Cool. So um, that was question number one. The second question was, what was it like working on Soul? So I'm not sure if any of you have seen the latest Pixar movie that came out on Christmas Day. Um, anyone seen it? Yeah? No? Okay, <laughs> cool. One person seen it. Cool, cool. Um, so it, it's a pretty amazing movie. Um, it's uh, it's uh, Pixar's first movie that has a, a black male lead. Um, and the um, the movie sort of centers around the meaning of life, um, but he- very heavily on jazz music. And um, yeah, it was such a privilege to be a part of um, such an amazing movie. And uh, the musical director was uh, John Baptiste, who's on the Steve Colbert Late Show. I've known John for quite a while. Uh, we've, we've done a few gigs here and there before he was on the late show. Um, we did some gigs out in California and, and here in New York City. Um, and I went to school with Joey Saylor, the, the drummer, who's the drummer on the late show. So we were in the same combo together. Um, so yeah, um, he's such an amazing talent, John, and he's uh, he just embodies um, joy in his music and, and he's just such a creative, um, talented, human being. Um, and then it also had Tia Fuller on saxophone and Marcus Gilmer on drums, as well as the late Roy, uh, the amazing great <laughs> drummer Roy Haynes, who is the grandfather of Marcus Gilmore. Um, so that was my first time um, playing with the amazing Roy Haynes. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's played with everyone from Coltrane to um, you know, um, the, the late Chick Corea, you know, um, the album Now He Sings, Now He Sobs, um, he's the drummer on that. Um, and uh, yeah, it was such an amazing project to be a part of. Uh, there were various consultants as well, um, cultural consultants who helped to sort of advise on the general portrayal of, of the music and and the characters, um, how they would sort of portray jazz and um, that included um, the great drummer Terry Lynn Carrington who um, 
teachers also at Berkeley College of Music. Um, but yeah, it was it was amazing. It was just two days at uh, the studio in LA in Capitol Records um, studio. Uh, and um, I actually have some photos um, that I could share. It might be of interest. Um, let me see if I can share screen. Okay. And just so you get an idea of, of this, this is some of the behind the scenes. And I was very lucky because I'm not the best with taking photos in the moment. And um, so Tia Fuller took some of these photos, but this is the late, the amazing um, Roy Haynes, um, who was playing drums. Um, that's this, the setup that we had, one of the setups, because one of them was in isolation and this one is not isolated. You see the baffles, but we were all in the same room, which was pretty cool um, and unusual, you know, to do for a session like this. Um, uh, so some of this stuff was, um, I didn't actually get the music until like the, the day of, you know, um, and we talked a little bit about it the, the night before. And um, so this is like a rough set list. We sort of played through some of these tunes and there's a scene in the movie where they're at the nightclub and they sort of go through a whole set and they take snippets of some of these songs and sort of stream it as if it was a uh, sort of a montage of a whole set of music at the jazz club. So we, we played all these tunes. Um, and so what's interesting and what I, I keep saying to students is that the importance of internalizing um, because, and really learning your tunes, because someday you might get called to do a Pixar movie and there's no sheet music and they just have a set list of just songs that you should know, you know, um, and, or you have a good enough ear that you can just put, you know, get ready and go. Um, not to mention, um, being able to sight read. Um, so here, here was the set list and then, um, you know, this is one of the songs, but um, being able to sight read is really useful, you know, um, when you get put in that position. Um, so, and this is just the, the um, one of the quartets with Marcus on the left here, John and myself. And um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Um, Mr. Roy Haynes there on drums, it was so incredible. Um, yeah, it's really funny because, I mean, he, he's also played um, for a long time with guitarist Pat Metheny and there was one point in the session towards the end of a song and we finished the song and he just started playing um, the tune James which is a Pat Metheny composition very popular composition and and John being the amazing musician like just launched in and he knew the song too everyone knew the song so we all just started playing the song and no one no one had called it or anything it was it was a really beautiful moment actually and I just wanted to show this photo um, the greatest photo in jazz history and there's Mr. Roy Haynes there in the background um, with Charlie Parker, Mingus and, and Monk so just to, to give a bit of context for any of you who don't know who Roy Haynes is yeah cool so that was um, some some behind the scenes photos of um, playing on soul. Um, one of the questions is how do you practice and what are you practicing right now? Um, at the moment, how I practice is I wait for my baby to fall asleep and then I run, run, run to the <laughs> base, see how much I can do. And then as soon as I hear a cry, I run back. Um, how do I practice? Ideally, well, before everything changed, <laughs> I, you know, I would have some, um, some key things that I would work on, um, probably priority, uh, prioritize what I would need to get done. Um, and that might mean preparing music for one of my shows or a recording or someone else's recording, specific um, sort of things I need to work towards. Uh, but there's still fundamental things that I work on all the time. And I keep saying that to all students that there are certain fundamentals that are really important to, um, to just every day just keep up, you know, it, on the bass, on the upright bass and electric bass, there are certain technical things that you just have to keep up, you know, um, and um, just to keep the strength in the hands. And um, for upright bass, it means um, specific arco work that I like to sort of knock out and keep as a, a fundamental routine. Uh, I also like to change things up though. When it becomes a fundamental routine, I try and cha change things slightly so that I'm not always on autopilot when it comes to technique. 
Um, and then I'll just I'll sort of compartmentalize um, to a certain degree of stuff I need to work on and some fundamentals, but I'll, I might even cross some of those things together to get a mix of both. Um, so sometimes I, I tell students that, okay, say you have a set of scales that you want to practice as a fundamental technical warm up. Um, try playing those scales and thinking about their relationship to some chord changes that you're working over or something like that. So, um, so you're just, you're still working in a technical work, but you're combining it with things um, conceptually that you may use, you know, in terms of improvisation. If you're playing an F major scale, um, you know, instead of just thinking, oh, F major scale, I do that every day. One day you could, um, you could play F major scale and um, yeah, you could play F major scale, but also think, um, all right, this is over a D minor chord. And maybe if you have a piano, play the D minor and, and hear how that relates to the F major. You could play an F major scale and think of it as using it over a G sus chord or something like that and, and think about how that sounds, you know. So um, sort of combining those things. Um, but that's generally these days, um, well, roughly <laughs> these days, what, how I sort of go about. And at the moment, I have a f quite a few recordings that are due. So it's just sort of checking out some of those, um, um, those pieces. Some of them are challenging time signatures, um, challenging forms. Um, and I'm just, yeah, just checking them out, trying to internalize them and get them, um, get them good for the recording. And um, uh, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it, it's interesting um, when you have pieces that you're working towards for a specific goal, I like to definitely take the ideas of the piece and make it into exercises and things that I can run through separate from the actual piece because um, I feel like you internalize things more when you actually take the concept away from the thing you're working on and impose it somewhere else. Um, so, so that's kind of what I do. Um, I still um, play standards. I still put standards in different keys because it's fun and it's great. It's a great oral workout and just to get the fingers going in different keys. Um, so um, there's a lot of that and still working towards, um, you know, internalizing some other rhythmic things. I was lucky enough to receive an award called the Margaret Witten Award where I can um, get lessons with um, uh, two prominent artists that, who I really respect and one of them is the great Maria Schneider who is also a guest at Wellesley and um, percussionist, Cuban percussionist Roman Diaz who's an amazing percussionist and all-round musician and um, the goal before COVID hit was to get bata lessons um, from him uh, but then COVID hit so we're, we're hang we, we have we brought the bata here to Australia where we are at the moment and when we return to New York we'll Will catch up so i'm checking out some of those um bata rhythms just to sort of get accustomed to them ahead of time yeah but yeah um so that's um that's pretty much what's going on and um okay what's your favorite part of the composing process the most frustrating as well um so that's the question um what's the favorite part and what is the most frustrating um, my favorite part is when I get into that zone, <laughs> when I'm, when you just get into a role and the ideas just flow and you're, you're making decisions decisively and, and you're in a space where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good. And you really, you get to a point where you really hear what everything that's going on, you've got everything really internalized and it's just a matter of just, um, figuring out where some of the puzzle pieces fit and and you're really heading towards that home stretch. The frustrating part, I think sometimes is like um, the, um, I guess the the initial sort of push, you know, um, getting over that hump of, um, you know, just getting started sometimes. I mean, I, I can generally get started, but there's just, after getting a few ideas, there's a little hump for me, which is like, okay, how, how do you get into that flow of things? And um, sometimes it's really about um, just thinking about your options, being decisive, and also just knowing yourself that um, it's not the be all and end all. Even if you choose one route with, with the music, 
you can always take a step back and take away that step and then take another round, you know. So um, just seeing what are the options available to you and how you want to move forward, um, that, that's kind of, um, ha that's sort of an, a challenging part for me. Once you've initially gotten some concepts, it's just that hump to get into that flow of things. And, and for me, I, it's, it's, it's about being decisive and also just really thinking about what you want from the composition besides thinking, is this good or bad? You know, I think at the minute that you try and put positive or negative content connotations, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. It's more about like, what is it? What, what do you want it to be? What emotion do you want to sort of get out? What, story do you want to tell you know and um uh, what do you want to do with that music and and i guess the other thing is like feeling like the music is 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 yourself you know um because often like w especially when you're checking out a lot of music especially if you've um if you've been studying a lot of music sometimes you feel an obligation to write a certain way and i think the minute you can shake off the obligations the more true to yourself that you can, you can make the music and and I, I kind of think the better it's going to sound because you're not you're not feeling pressure to to write in a certain way. Cool. Um, so this is from Abby, great guitar student. Um, are there any albums, tunes, solos that you think every jazz musician should know? Um, yeah, so I was thinking about it. Um, and I mean, a lot of this is instrument specific and I could de definitely speak as a bass player, um, for one. Um, uh, but I, I'll just go through some general albums. I think that every jazz musician should know, you know, and I, I think probably, um, you know, albums such as kind of blue, Miles Davis kind of blue. Um, if, if I were to list all the, the important jazz albums that everyone should know it, it there are a lot <laughs> and I, i'm just sort of thinking on the top of my head but um uh kind of blue um uh the genius of charlie parker um uh coltrane live at the village vanguard um and i, I have a, a playlist that i could share um with the students too that you could have a look and this is um this is by no means the be all and end all but these are just some that i i thought of um and uh, and again, a lot of this is instrument specific because I realized as I was thinking about it that uh, you know as a rhythm section player you sort of gravitate towards your instrument and also um, um, uh, towards probably like for me uh, a lot of my concentration is on the rhythm section so I find myself finding a lot of piano trios and and I had to just step back a bit and think okay well what if I was a horn player what if I was you know a guitarist like Abby is and and so I did include some guitar there which I think is um is important so well, let me just try this I'll just share screen um get out my And just as a side note, um, if anyone has Apple Music, I, I was asked by Apple for this month to curate a um, playlist of celebrating Women's History Month. So uh, you can look out for that. I think it was just put online um, just in, in the last several hours, um, but it's a whole playlist of uh, primarily jazz musicians, not all jazz musicians, um, um, visionary women who have um, really released some amazing music so uh, look out for that on apple music um, it was really fun to do it and, and such a privilege to do that um, so let me just um, okay so these are just some some of the albums and um so oh i guess i put the whole album of so I put So What Kind of Blue, Relaxin' with Miles Davis Quintet, Live at the Plug Nickel, and I wanted to show those three because those are the iconic, um, I, I think, um, well, Relaxin', that's kind of arguable. It just, you, you show, it shows the two sort of great quintets that Miles Davis had in this period with the albums such as Relaxin', Workin', Steamin', Cookin', and then uh, Fireball, the, the later quintet with Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, 
Tony Williams, um, Wayne Shorter, uh, as well as So What was such an iconic album um, in terms of modal jazz and um, just amazing playing and really great solos. As I said, Chase and Train, um, uh, Live at the Village Vanguard, Coltrane, and I, I just chose Chase and the Train, but check out the whole record. There's only three songs on there. <laughs> and um, uh, Ornette Coleman, Shape of Jazz to Come. I, I love Monk with Coltrane, but there are also other important Monk um, albums, Brilliant Corners, um, Straight No Chaser. Um, Abby, this one's for you. I, I know, I'm not sure if you can make it tonight, but um, um, Abby's the one who asked the question. So I, I put the incredible jazz guitar of Wes Montgomery and Smoking at the Half Note, which is um, one of uh, its, I'm pretty sure that's one of um, Pat Metheny's um, favorite albums too. Um, uh, Night Train, Oscar Peterson Trio, that's sort of what got me into playing upright bass. I was hearing Ray Brown on that. Days of Wine and Roses. Um, I, I just love that particular track from, from We Get Requests. And um, some of the students and I have been talking about playing ahead of the beat, behind the beat. And this is sort of a, a classic track that you can really tell that, that Ray's a little bit um, ahead and he's, he's just got that, the spring in the step when he's walking. Um, and just some other ones, uh, um, Bill Evans, Sunday at the Village Vanguard. Um, and as a bass player, Scott LaFaro on that, um, it's, it's just an iconic album. Um, uh, Charlie Parker with Strings, The Genius of Charlie Parker. Ella and Louis, Ella Fitzgerald with Louis Armstrong. I spoke about the Atomic Mr. Basie um, in one of the classes. Um, and another one of my favorites is, is um, uh, Basie plays the hits of Frank Sinatra as well as um, Basie with Frank Sinatra live at the Sands, which is amazing. Um, Ellington, uh, Money Jungle, um, that's with Mingus and um, Max Roach, and uh, here Mingus, Boogie Stop Shuffle, but these are just a few. Um, did I? Okay, cool. And, and I meant to include also just for Abby, um, Undercurrents with, with um, Bill Evans and um, Jim Hall, because I just thought Abby would be interested in that, hearing Jim Hall on that. So those are just some, and, um, and like the more I look through, I'm like, oh, there's this one, there's this one, there's that one, you know, and, and it's, it's really hard to narrow it down. Um, and I generally kept it to like the 50s and 60s, but as we all know, there's, there's various sub genres within the, the genre of jazz. So it's kind of hard to sort of pinpoint, but those are important albums to check out. Cool. Um, when composing a piece, do you begin with a melody or with the chords? Um, it really depends. Um, it, it can be with melody, can be with chords. And, and there was one particular piece, Deep Sea Dances, that I worked with, um, uh, with the uh, Angels group, um, Paula's Angels. And that definitely started with a melody. And we worked with a harmony. Um, um, and I showed how it was sort of more a reharmonization of what was in the melody. So, so it's sort of both. Um, sometimes I start with the chords, um, and then, and then um, I, I can even show you an example of of one of my songs that I started with the chords, which is a little bit different. Um, uh, I'll share screen with audio. Um, so. See if I can find it. Oh yeah, here it is. So, so this one I started off with the chords. Um, well, actually no, I started actually with the rhythm. The rhythm was the first thing that I started with, which it, you'll see um, the rhythm in the middle staff. Actually, no, in the bottom staff. That's the rhythm that I started with, and so it's neither melody or chords. I started off with the rhythm and then the chords, and last was the melody. And if you look at the chords, um, A major. D flat major, A flat major, C major. So you look at those first four chords. They're all major chords. And it's, it's just four chords. And if you see in the second line, it's the same four chords, but just in a different combination. And then the next line is the same thing, same four chords. We're always starting with A major, but just different combination, right? So that was kind of the idea. We start with the chords and then, then the melody. And I'll just play, play it real quick. 
This is just an intro. Right, so I'll just stop it there um, and yeah so you just get an idea of of, um, of what that was like so th so that was the process with that um, yeah and and so now I guess another answer to the question is that sometimes the rhythm is what I start with you know not the melody or the chords um, so okay cool so can you talk about some of the pieces from your beautiful release Aventurine and perhaps show us some scores and speak a bit about your thinking using a string quartet and jazz quartet, the double quartet idea, and that's from Circe. Um, yeah, so I can show you a score um, and I'll show you the title track. Um, so um, a lot of this music I've been working on for a while. Um, some of the pieces on the whole album were I started about 10 years ago and it was sort of a slow burn that I've been work workshopping over the years. Um, the thing with a, a large-ish group, an eight-piece group, is that um, generally in terms of performing, you don't get to perform it weekly or fortnightly. It's, it's sort of like maybe a few times a year, maybe three, four times a year. And so over the years, I sort of workshopped uh, some of the tunes on the album. Uh, and some of the tunes were quite fresh that were sort of written for the session, which um, I recorded in late 2018 and it was out in 2019. Um, so, um, yeah, so I guess um, a lot of it was sort of a slow burn and I, I love um, string quartets and I've checked out a lot of scores of Beethoven, Ravel and um, Debussy and um, uh, it was a setting that I wanted to uh, include in my writing, so I liked the idea of the double quartet. Um, but I also loved albums such as Andrew Hill's um, uh, One for One album, um, which features string quartet, as well as um, James Blood Ulmer's um, High Melodics um, uh, with strings. So um, in the jazz setting, like um, there were certain albums too that I, I really enjoyed. Um, uh, Joni Mitchell's travel log has, has beautiful orchestral arrangements and, um, you know, Charlie Parker with strings, beautiful arrangements. And, um, I'd always liked the idea of writing for strings, um, in more of an improvised, uh, jazz setting. Um, uh, and I'm lucky enough to know, uh, string players who are very versatile, who can improvise and who have, have just a great sensibility for, for a lot of music that I write. So, um, from there it sort of grew and um, it became this album. Um, so I'll share with you the first track and I'll, I'll show a score that we can read through. Um, uh, please don't screenshot anything just so, just because I, uh, there were parts of the score that I need to be formatted more correctly and um, but but you can get an idea of the um, the whole piece just by checking it out. So let me share the screen um, and just a bit of a background. Um, most of the music musicians are based in New York City. The alto saxophone player Greg Ward is, is based in Chicago and Indiana. Um, uh, on the rhythm section, it's um, Matt Mitchell on piano, uh, Chess Smith on drums, and then a great string quartet of New York based um, uh, string musicians, Sarah Caswell, uh, who's an amazing Grammy nominated violinist who was recently featured on 
Brad Meldow's Finding Gabriel album. Um, from the Serious Quartet, we have Feng Chen Hui on violin and Jeremy Harmon on cello. And then from the Turtle Island Quartet, we have Benny von Goodsight. Um, and in addition to that, you'll hear a choir, which is based in Melbourne, directed by a great vocalist. Um, if you haven't heard of her, her name's Gian Slater, G-I-A-N Slater, and her group is called Invenio, um, Invenio Singers. So I'll just play this for you.
Cool. So that's the title track of Venturine. Um, and um, Aventurine is a type of quartz. It's um, usually found in um, a sort of a green color. People often think it's jade, but there's a sort of a shimmer, shimmering quality. So, and they call that shimmering quality aventurescence. Um, so I, I kind of wanted this album to ha capture that sort of shimmering thing, but um, and have that texture with the strings. And um, although the album does go sort of several different places, um, that's something I particularly wanted to capture especially in this piece. Um, and, and the idea is that you start off um, the beginning, that intro, that string intro, is sort of like the sunrise, it's like the beginning of the day. And I dedicated this to one of my nieces, who's she's a real character. She has so much energy. And um, so it's sort of for her and her waking up in the morning, you know, the sunrise, and then just, you're ready to go. This is playful quality to it, where she's just off and out to explore the world. And at the end, when you get into that sort of lush area with all the the um, the singers and the choir, that's when you you're a little kid and you you're just exploring, and then you're, you've just come to this sort of empty plain that just seems so huge. You know, sort of like when you're a little kid and you go to a park, and the park just seems like it's so huge when it's only just like one block, one square block or something. And um, so that's sort of the idea. Cool. Um, and yeah, you can check out that album on um, uh, online. It's on Apple Music and all the rest of it. It's also Bandcamp Friday today and Bandcamp is amazing. Um, I, I've said this to the students as well that, you know, with the music industry, it's um, it's tricky with the streaming services. And at least we have platforms like Bandcamp who are doing great things for musicians. And every once in a while, every Friday, especially during this, these pandemic times, they're, um, um, I think all the um, everything that's bought on Bandcamp Fridays, all the proceeds go directly to musicians. Um, so um, yeah, they're they're an amazing um, company, Bandcamp. So please check out music on Bandcamp. Um, great. Um, so one of the questions is, were there any pieces that you played when you were younger that still stick with you today? Um, yeah, there's still quite a few piano pieces. I started off on classical piano, so. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a few um, uh, piano pieces that stick with me. Um, there's a um, there's an A minor uh, Brahms ballad. Um, I can't remember what number it was, but it's the melody is like. That's that's such a beautiful piece and really hard to play on piano too. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, uh yeah um as well as you know my days playing bassoon you know I, I loved playing in orchestras and um you know playing stuff like the unfinished symphony and um, being part of the orchestra um uh in terms of jazz yeah i mean there's still lots of standards that i learned you know as a beginner that i, I still play to this day and people still call them and it, it's 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 super useful to know and um that's why i just i keep I keep um, stressing to students, you know, the value of internalizing and just really um, beyond just memorizing chord changes and melodies, really understanding how these songs work because they they really help when you apply it to other situations as well. And and I there are lots of standards with just beautiful melodies that I enjoy playing. Great. Um, okay, so I guess we're we're kind of heading towards the end of the session. Um, yeah, um, so do you have a genre? Uh, okay, so maybe I'll, um, I'll, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll try and I'll, I'll answer, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll answer this one question, um, which is the next question, but, um, I d actually, I, I'm gonna, if it's okay, I'm gonna answer two questions. <laughs> It's hard to kind of choose from all of these. These are fantastic um, questions. But um, so one of them is, um, do you have a genre artist that you particularly enjoy listening to when not working on your own music? And um, a one artist that I, I generally always say is that um, I just think she's really amazing. Um, she's a bass player, Michelle Andegia Cello. And um, 
you know, she's she's sort of um, affiliated with the jazz realm, but I guess she's more R and B soul. But she's such a creative musician, and um, I just love the music that she writes. And she's a fantastic singer, songwriter, producer, um, and she's done so much amazing work. Albums like um, Plantation Lullabies, Peace Beyond Passion, um, and, and more recently, sort of the uh, Nina Simone um, tribute album that she put out. Um, uh, yeah, she's, um, she's just amazing. So that's one person. Um, and, um, um, and as far as genres, it's kind of like, th there's just so much that I enjoy listening to. I mean, everything from, um, electronic music to, um, to classical music, to, um, to folk music. I've just been listening to a wonderful folk band. I'm with her, um, and they're fantastic. Um, uh yeah um there's, there's just so much great great music out there um so now I'll, I'll get to maybe the last question um ah okay um yeah what was the audition process for pat metheny like so um so i, I play with the guitarist pat metheny and um i guess the audition process was um we, I, I met him backstage at Detroit Jazz Festival. Um, this was quite a few years back. Um, and before then, we had met once and we chatted briefly uh, at the same festival, but just a couple of years preceding that. Um, but then I, I saw him again backstage um, when I was just walking around and checking out some of my friends play. And and he, he said, oh, did you ever get my email? I, I was wondering if we could play, you know, and, and I never got the email. I'm not sure what happened, if maybe he got the wrong email or I, I'm not really sure if maybe it's out in the ether somewhere. But I did go home and I checked my email and I didn't seem to find anything. But I gave him my correct email and um, he asked me to come over and play some duo with him. And, um, and then we played duo with um, Antonio Sanchez. And you know, Pat, someone that I, I already knew most of his tunes. Um, I've been um, learning them since I was a student. And, and again, I'll go back to the, the benefits of internalizing and just really enjoying playing the music that you like and really uh, checking it out so that you're not glued to a page. Um, I, you know, I already knew most of his music and I would even practice along to um, like, uh, and I was a big fan of Antonio Sanchez's music as well, great drummer. And um, I would I would practice along with it, one of his records, which is was called Migration, one of his first migration records. And one of the tracks had a version of Solar, which was duo drums and guitar with Pat. Um, and and I, I remember listening to that and being like, oh wow, amazing! And I would practice along with that and play along and pretend that I was part of the trio. And then when we were um, playing at Pat's place, um, he called some tunes and solo just happened to be one of them. And it was just, you know, I was like, yeah, this I've been I've been preparing for this, you know, in many ways, unknowingly. It wasn't like I ever thought I'd ever be in that position. So it just goes to show that, you know, you you, you shed the music that you love, you really check it out and, and you might get in that position sometimes to actually um, be a part of a band in that way, you know. Cool. And somebody did write the question, I guess there's no question, but show us your baby. <laughs> Nilo, my baby, did make an uh, appearance at the sound check, but I think he's taking a nap now, but he's very sweet. He's a real sweetheart and um, yeah, I'm very, very lucky. Linda, I, I hate to even say that we're coming near the end of the evening. We, we, um... This has just been so incredible. So many wonderful things. I can't believe you had those fantastic pictures from the session with Murray Haynes. And mm. oh my gosh, you know, I, I, you. I think we could keep you here for four hours and not exhaust <laughs> all the great, you know, stories and your music. And uh, just you've shared so much with us. But actually, Isabel Fine, she gets to ask a question. Isabel thought it would be nice in our last moments if you wanted to. Uh, say anything about your the residency anything more about your residency with the students here or just in general yeah. what it's like working with um, yeah. um, you know working now as an educator and model yourself yeah you talk sometimes about your experiences but now you're 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 making experience for these students mm. 
Yeah, first of all, um, I just think it's incredible um, how these students have stepped up in such a short amount of time. I've only really spent three weeks um, with most of them and uh, some of them um, were checking out the music even before they got to school, you know, even before the school term started. And that in combination with the fact that there is a global pandemic, you know, and um, it, it is incredible. And I'm, I'm so impressed at um, the attitude, first of all, um, how open everyone has been, how diligent everyone has been. Um, and on top of everything that, you know, a lot of these students are, are um, studying neuroscience, studying physics, you know, taking all these um, very heavy um, workloads and, uh, and courses um, in addition to this. And they can check out this very challenging music, which is challenging even for music majors, you know, that I, I bring to um, combos and to, to um, various uh, programs. So they've really stepped up and um, a lot of them are getting used to the technology, which is not easy, you know, um, and it's just incredible. I, I can't imagine what it would be like um, you know, being a student during the pandemic, and they've really stepped up, and I'm so impressed. Well, you really inspired them too, and and just taking time to kind of, you know, share. You're so open with you have been so open with our students to want really wanting to hear from them, mm -hmm. and you know, when you lead a listening session or um, a session about swing and triplets or whatever it is, you're 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 not just talking at the students you're really working with them and wanting to hear from them and waiting to hear from them and i've been so impressed we all have and we thank you so much mm, and thank uh, you. you know we just want to say that we're gonna we are now big fans and we will be following you and um i just hope in a future time we will be able to come hear you live because i'm sure mm. you'll be back to boston area or wherever wherever our students are but yeah. especially here in boston where we can come in and uh, experience you playing live would be something I hope and dream for. We'll, we'll, we will make a field trip when that happens and <laughs> get on a Beautiful. bus and get there. <laughs> so we'll be in, in touch. But um, I guess we have come to the end of this wonderful event. And we just want to thank Linda Mehano for an amazing, wonderful evening for, and also for providing that fantastic residency experience for our students. And we should also thank our Wellesley College Department of Music for sponsoring this residency and, and supporting our students this way. And um, also Isabel Fine and her concert series staff for producing this event and also producing the wonderful concert that Linda Mejano and um, also Fabian Amanzara did in the fall, which was just fantastic. And I hope somehow we can still find that maybe on our YouTube channel. But um, uh, we will be following you and we will be uh, hopefully hearing more about the incredible things you're doing. Everyone should check out the latest, the album, Adventurine is so beautiful. And uh, we thank you and... Thank you, Ceci. Thank you, everyone. Amazing work. Good night to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.